church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Fifth Sunday. Church of this, yeah, yeah, we can clap for that. This is fun. This is fun being in the gym. This is a unique opportunity. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. Um, we're so glad that you're here. Um, this is different for us. This is unique for us. We don't typically do this. We do this every fifth Sunday where we're able to gather together um, as a united body um, in the church and worship together in here. So again, if you're visiting, we're glad you're here. We would love for you to check out one of our information centers um, out there in the hallway as you leave today. Um, everybody else, make sure to fill out that friendship register. Make sure to put any prayer requests down, your record of attendance, all that stuff. And as we get started this morning, um, church, I had a bit of a um, I don't know if I want to call it an epiphany because it's setting it up for like this really big thing, but I had a bit of a thought this week um, about this first song that we're going to sing this morning, this song called Take You At Your Word that we've sang for a while now. Um, this song, um, the first line of it comes right out of Psalm 119, verse 105, which says this. Um, it's up on the screen. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And now with that, I kind of wanted to kind of paint a little bit, little bit of a word picture um, for you with this. So when I get up in the morning on Sunday mornings, the majority of my house, or not the majority, my entire house is asleep in the morning. So I get up pretty early on Sunday mornings. And with that, my one goal is to one, get ready and look presentable for church. But the second goal is to make sure that I don't wake up my son, <laughs> is to not wake up my one-year-old. Um, because if he wakes up, he's not going to be happy. And then if he wakes up, mama's not going to be very happy because um, she's asleep too. And so kind of the way that I do this in the morning is I'll take my phone and all the lights are off and I'll turn on my flashlight with my phone and I'll kind of walk around the house. I look really weird, I'm sure. And I walk around my house with my flashlight and I try to be super quiet. Um, and now I had kind of just kind of this thought this, um, this week that that using my flashlight to kind of guide my light is is kind of similar to what this verse is saying. That And, and that if we use the word and we study the word, we digest the word, we, we meditate on the word in our lives, it is, you know, it is gonna guide our entire path. In, this, in the same way that my flashlight <laughs> guides my path when I'm halfway asleep um, at four o'clock in the morning on a Sunday trying to get ready. And so church, I just challenge you this morning that if you are not actively in the word, get in it, find a plan. We offer plans at the church. There's plans online. Um, we at Faith are truly a church that truly values the word. And we see the power in reading the word, in reading the word, and have it be a part of your everyday life. And so I just challenge you to do that. So friends, would you stand with me? And we're gonna sing this song that focuses on the truth of the word. Let's sing together.
said your love will never give up. And you said your grace is always enough. You said your heart will never forget or forsake me. You said I'm safe. You call me yours. You said my future's full of your hope. And you never fail. So I know that you. You said your love will never give up. You said your grace is always enough. You said your heart will never forget or forsake me. No. You said I'm safe. You call me yours. You said my future is full of your hope. You never fail. So I know. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Sing this out together. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his word and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms, yes he is, oh.
fears, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. As Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Yes, he does, friends. He loves us.
great is our God. Friends, sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Let's sing that again, friends. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, we'll see how great, and how great is our God. Father God, right now here in this place, we, we focus in and we acknowledge your greatness. You are a God that is amazing and holy and above and above all and set apart. And God, you are great. You are a great king to us. Father, we thank you for being a king that rules kindly, that rules justly. And ultimately a, a king that loves us and that sees us. Father, we give you praise for those things this morning. Father, now we give our hearts and we give our minds to you. Teach us, focus us, speak through your word today. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name that we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Church family, you can be seated. All right, to make one clarification, when we say fifth Sunday, we mean fifth Sunday of the month. Don't count five Sundays and then come in here. Okay, fifth Sunday of the month. It happens four times a year. Also, on the fifth Sunday of the month, when we meet in here, um, some people say, I, I brought an offering, I just don't know where to put it. So um, just give it to me at the end of the service. <laughs> no, there are baskets uh, and the box uh, in the end... Uh, as you go out the door, if you'd like to give uh, to the offering. We don't really promote offering giving, although uh, we think that is an act of worship, and uh, that's between you and the Lord. I don't want anyone to ever think all they want is your money. That's not who I am. I think that's a private matter between you and God. If you want to cheat him, go right ahead. He knows how to make things, uh, he knows how to level the playing field, so... Um, we're stewards of all that he's given to us, and uh, we need to be faithful stewards of what he's given to us. Um, at the end of the service, um, I'm going to need some hugs. And there, I don't normally get hugs, and I don't want hugs, but uh, the New York Mets are stumbling badly. <laughs> Those uh, Milwaukee Brewers are taking them to the cleaners, and Beat them two games straight if they win today. I think the Mets are out of contention for a playoff spot. So I need a hug, especially from you Cubs fans who are already out of it. <laughs> so you need one too. We're going to conclude our series today, which is Abraham, the man of faith. And we're going to look at chapter 23 and chapter 25 of Genesis. And I invite you to turn there right now, Genesis chapter 23. If you don't have a Bible, I think we did put some in the seats in front of you. And so take one out, go to the first book of the Bible, that's Genesis, to page 15, and you'll find Genesis chapter 23. I titled this message today, uh, The Man of Faith Widowed, Remarried, and Died. Now, he didn't die because he got remarried, but I'll get into that later. But Abraham is a man of faith, for it says in Genesis 15, 6, then he, meaning Abraham, believed in the Lord, put his trust in the Lord, and he, the Lord, reckoned it, counted it to him as righteousness. 
He was made righteous by his faith in the Lord. And as a man of faith, we've tracked his ups and downs on his journey of faith. He worshiped the Lord. This is one of those ups by building altars when he traveled and then calling on the name of the Lord. As a man of faith, we saw and have been seeing that Abraham was quick to obey the word of the Lord. But as a man of faith, he made his mistakes as well, which is good for me because I make mistakes all the time. And it should be good for you because as a man or a woman of God, you will make mistakes. No amens? Do you make mistakes? Yeah, we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Just because you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord does not mean you don't sin anymore. You do sin. And that's why we need to confess. And he is righteous and will forgive us of our sins. So as a man of faith, he made mistakes. Twice he brought trouble on his wife when he passed her off as his sister. Remember that? Once to Pharaoh and once to Abimelech, the king of Gerar. And today we'll be wrapping up our study on Abraham, covering his wife's death, his remarriage, and then his death. So if you're in your text right now in Genesis 23, let me read for you. Now, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Then Abraham rose from before his dead and spoke to the sons of Heth, saying, I'm a stranger and sojourner among you. Give me a burial site among you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The sons of Heth answered Abraham and said, or saying to him, Hear us, my Lord, you are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our graves. None of us will refuse you his grave for burying your dead. So Abraham rose and bowed to the people of the land, the sons of Heth. And he spoke with them, saying, if, you, if it is your wish for me to bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and approach Ephron, the son of Zohar, for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns, which is at the end of his field, for the full price let him give it to me in your presence for a burial site. Now Ephron was sitting among the sons of Heth, and Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the sons of Heth, even to all who went in at the gate of the city, saying, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the presence of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. And Abraham bowed before the people of the land. He spoke to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, saying, If you will only please listen to me, I will give the price of the field accepted from me that I may bury my dead there. Then Ephraim answered Abraham, saying to him, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver, what is that between me and you? So bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver which he had named in the hearing of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, commercial standard. So Ephron's field, which was in Machpelah, which faced Mamre, the field and cave which was in it, and all the trees which were in the field that were within all the confines of its border, were handed, were deeded over to Abraham for a possession in the presence of the sons of Heth before all who went in at the gate of his city. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah facing Mamre. That is Hebron in the land of Canaan. So the field and the cave that is in it were deeded over to Abraham for a burial site by the sons of Heth. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, as we think of the scripture that I just read and the scripture that I'll be reading in a little bit, we're reminded that death will be the end of every person. And we're asking that the Spirit of God would open our eyes to the words of God and especially to our hearts and minds that we would be sober-minded when we think of death and what comes next. And so, Lord, guide me as I 
and preach your word. May the Spirit of God take these words and impress them upon our hearts. We pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. My theme is pretty simple. The end of every person's life is death. Oh, this is going to be a joyful message. (laughs) The end of every person's life is death. Scripture records two instances that are exceptions to death. We've studied one already in Genesis. It's in Genesis chapter 5, verses 23 and 24, and this person is named Enoch. In Genesis 3, 23, it says, So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. First rapture in Scripture, and God took him. The second one is Elijah, and you'll find that in 2 Kings 2, verse 11. And as they were walking, going along, this is Elijah and Elisha, As they were going along and talking, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by whirlwind to heaven. Two exceptions to every person's life will end in death. Because of man's sin in the garden, Adam's and Eve's sin in the garden, we all will die one day. The Lord told Adam in Genesis 3, verse 19, by the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Moses wrote a psalm in Psalm 90, and in that psalm in verse 3 it says, you turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men. The end of every person's life is death. Siggy Marvin, the boy theologian, said to Bob Wiley in the movie, What About Bob? Siggy said, we're all going to die. I'm going to die. He says to Bob, who's in the bed next to him because they're rooming together for this one night, you're going to die. But in your case, it'll happen sooner. (laughs) Siggy's about seven or eight years old when he said that. But we're all going to die. Chapter 23, we see Abraham's wife, Sarah, died. In verses 1 and 2, it says she lived for 127 years. It says she died at Kiriath Arbor. Kiriath is a word, Kir is city, so it means like cities of Arba or city. Arba, it means four. It might be a city that's broken up into four quadrants. It might have been that these cities were close together, which became one city, which they later called Hebron. Or it could be a city of Arba, meaning the father of a man named Anak. In Joshua 15, it says this. Now he, Joshua, gave to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the sons of Judah, according to the command of the Lord, to Joshua, namely Kiriath Arbar, Arba being the father of Anak, that is Hebron. And Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Sheshai and Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak. And so we don't know exactly what Kiriath Arbor means. It might be the arbor that's a man, and it's his city that Caleb eventually conquered. It tells us in the text that Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah. It means he went inside her tent and he wept for her. They've been married for many, many years as husband and wife. If they celebrated anniversaries, I wonder what their 100th anniversary was like. Many years of marriage. And she dies in Kiriath Arbor. Now, I have a map to show you where Hebron is. Amazingly, it's near the Oaks of Mamre. This is Hebron, Kiriath Arbor. 
Last we heard, he was down in Beersheba after going uh, from Salem or Jerusalem where he offered up Isaac. We covered that last week. And they end up going down to um, Beersheba. Now they're at Hebron where she died. 127. She gave birth to Isaac at the age of 90. She had 37 years with her son. It tells us in Genesis 25, verse 20, that Isaac married Rebekah at the age of 40. Sarah had already died. Sarah had never seen her son get married. Sarah had never seen her son have two sons named Esau and Jacob. There's no guarantee in life how long you live before death comes. We as Americans always think that because of our great health care system and the good nutrients we eat at McDonald's and stuff that we're going to live at least into our 90s. But we don't know how long any of us are going to live. There's no guarantee of old age. Sarah died at 127 years old. That's the first thing to mention, how long she lived. Secondly, Abraham bought a burial site for Sarah. That was the longest section in this whole text of chapter 23. And you'll notice that he approached the sons of Heth with humility. He has three asks that are recorded here, three rounds of discussion. The first ask is to give me a burial site among you so that he could bury his dead. He preceded that ask with the statement of humility saying, I'm a stranger, I'm a sojourner among you. I'm a resident alien in this land. And they responded in verses 5 and 6 by saying, Hear us, my Lord. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choices of graves. The sons of Heth know who Abraham is. They give him high praise of his standing. He's a man of authority. He's a man of power and might. He's a very wealthy man. And they respond with this praise. Well, the second ask follows with a bow. Well, actually, the bow precedes the ask. And he says, approach Ephron for me, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah. And he wants the cave for the full price. It's obviously that Abraham had already picked out a place where he wants his burial because he's asking the person who owns it and he's asking in front of the gates of the city where the elders sat, where the sons of Heth, the leadership of the city of Hebron, Kiriath Arbor, sat. And he's doing a business deal here. And Ephron happens to be sitting right there. And he responds, no, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. All this takes place at the gate of the city. In verse 11, it says, in the presence of the sons of my people. It's in other words, he's like swearing that he's going to give it to Abraham to bury his dead. And then there's a third ask. And that also follows a bow. Abraham says, if you will only please listen to me. I'll give you the price. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead. And Ephron responds in verses 14 and 15. My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. But what is that? In other words, he just named his price. And 
And Abram listened to Ephron, and he weighed out the silver, 400 shekels of silver. My version says commercial standard. It's really a Hebrew saying that's the passing over to the one who goes around. Well, how do you get that? Well, the merchants go around, and they carry their scales with them. And so what he's basically saying is the current standard used by merchants. He weighed out 400 shekels of silver. And once he has the deed, Abraham buried his wife, Sarah. In verse 17 and 18, it's Ephron's field, which was in Machpelah, which faced Mamre. The field, the cave, and the trees, and all of that was deeded over to Abraham for a possession. And he buried Sarah. Do you realize that this is the first and only plot of land that Abraham will own in the land of Canaan? The whole land has been promised to him by the Lord. Remember, look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, to the west. I'm giving it to you and to your descendants after you forever. And this is the only plot of land that he'll own in his lifetime. A burial plot. John Salehammer in his commentary on Genesis in the Expositor's Bible Commentary series, he wrote, the point of the narrative of chapter 23 is to show how Abraham first came into legal possession of a parcel of land in Canaan. Through what appears to be a hard bargain, Abraham bought not only a cave in which to bury his wife, but also a large field with many trees. The chapter shows that Abraham came by this property fair and square. A similarity can be seen between Abraham's response to the offers of the sons of Heth and to those of the king of Sodom in chapter 14. In both cases, the writer wants to show the king of Sodom or that Abraham would not accept a gift from the Canaanites. When the king of Sodom offered to reward Abraham, he replied that it should never be said that the king of Sodom made Abraham wealthy. Chapter 14, verse 23. In the same way, Abraham adamantly refused to accept a parcel of land as a gift. Apparently, against the wishes of the Hethites, he paid the full price for the land. If viewed from the perspective of God's covenant promises to Abraham, both these narratives fit well within the overall themes of the book. God, not man, was the source of Abraham's hope of blessing. Ephron's field, and particularly the cave in it, became an important burial site for the patriarchs and their wives. In Genesis 49, verses 29 through following, listen to these words. Then he, that's Jacob, he charged them, meaning the 12 sons of Jacob or Israel. He charged them and said to them, I am about to be gathered to my people, meaning he's about to die. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field from Ephron the Hittite for a burial site. There they buried Abraham and his wife Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife Rebekah. And there I buried Leah. In the field, in the cave that is in it, purchased from the sons of Heth. When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Sacred spot. Machpelah. I was privileged to go on an Israel tour. Um, well, what was that? January 23, 22, 23? I forget. I'm getting old. We got to go to Hebron. Most times uh, when Kirk Glebe takes people on this trip, he doesn't go there because you have to go through Palestinian territory in order to get to Hebron, which is, is controlled by Israel. So we get to Hebron. And the first thing we see is this big structure called, it's, well, it's a Herod structure. He put this up. They believe this is Machpelah. 
And notice I got a bust in the frame. I'm not a very good photographer. So we're here at this big structure. The next picture is we're coming up to the entrance and we see before we get to this entrance, this, this kind of excavation where they're starting to do excavation and a big hole right here. And so we got closer to the hole. And I looked down into this hole. Next picture. And you can't see it very clearly, but there are caves down there. So it's underneath the whole structure of Herod's uh, big block building. And down below, we believe that these are the caves of Machpelah. So we go through the door, and when we get to the door, we have this statement, Marat ha, -mar ha Machpelah. Okay. Which means Marar is cave, cave of Machpelah. So we go inside and they have different gates. And this is the gate of Sarah, who's our mother. And then we get to another gate, which is our patriarch Abraham, which is, that's Abraham, our father. And they are not, we're not deep into the thing, but they have these separate places of where they, well, Israel goes to worship their, their ancestors but the caves are way below. Here's an article I could read to you about uh, how they discovered the caves far below by sending a little 12-year-old girl through this little hole. But if you're interested in that, just write it down in the French Register. I'd like to see that article. This has become a well-known place in biblical history. The patriarchs are buried at Machpelah. The end of every person's life is what? Death. Turn over to chapter 25. Chapter 24 is Abraham sends his servant to go get a bride for his son. That's more of the Isaac story, so we'll cover that some other time. But in chapter 25, it says, Now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore to him Zimron and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Asherim and Latushim and Loumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah and Epher and Hanak and Abida and Eldaah. All these were sons of Keturah. Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. Abraham remarried and had more children. He took another wife named Keturah. Most assume he took her after Sarah's death and he had children by Keturah. She bore Abraham six sons. They're listed in verse 2. I'm not going to go through their names again. This list is also recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 32 and 33. And of these six sons, two are mentioned, clearly, for more genealogy. It's a number two son, which is Jokshan. He fathered two people, Sheba and Dedan. And then they give the children of Dedan, the sons of Dedan, it gives us three. Asherim, Letushim, and Luimim. Now when you see an im ending, it just means uh, what we would say is an S in English. Houses, um, Anything that you want to make a noun with a plural, you put an S. Well, in Hebrew, it's the I-M at the end. So really, Asher is Assyria, which is going to come into play in biblical history. So the reason why it's in the text is because God wants the reader to know this is where the Assyrians came from. And the number fourth son is Midian. And Midian is the father of what's called the Midianites. Recall that Midian was positive things and negative things. The positive thing about Midian is that Moses married a Midian priest's daughter. His name was Jethro or Ruel, and 
he married Zipporah and had two children by Zipporah. But during the Exodus, the Moabites and the Midianites caused Israel to sin sexually at Baal of Peor, causing many deaths. Midianites were always going to be troublemakers to Israel, especially coming out of Egypt. So those two are pointed out clearly with genealogies because of what's going to come later in biblical history. But God made a promise to Abraham that he'd be a father of nations. He made that promise back in Genesis 17, looking at verse 4. The Lord says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be a father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I will make you a father of a multitude of nations, and I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. He's not just referring to the nation of Israel and Judah. He's referring to all of these sons of Keturah. We would call them Arabs today. All sons of Abraham. But Isaac is the son of promise. And Isaac, the son of promise, received all that Abraham had in verse 5. Although Abraham gave gifts to those of his other sons that were still alive, he gave them gifts, but he sent them away from his son Isaac. He sent them eastward. See, the land of promise was for his son Isaac. And he sent these other sons eastward. There's a big question today in Israel, whose land is that land? The text of Scripture is making it clear it belongs to Israel. Abram remarried and had more children. And right after he talks about giving it all to Isaac, and Isaac's going to be predominant now from here on out, and sending all the others eastward, he goes into his death. And he died at a ripe old age. Abram breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied. And he was gathered to his people. Then his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, facing Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. It, all right, and the rest of it starts with uh, Isaac. He dies at a ripe old age. He lived to be 175 years. He lived 38 years after the death of his wife, Sarah. It says he died at a good old age. How many would think 175 is a good old age? Yeah, I would think so too. He was promised that he would have a good old age. In Genesis 15, 15, the Lord, after Abraham believed in the Lord and accounted for his righteousness, a little later in the text, it says in verse 15, as for you... You shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. He died an old man, satisfied. Some versions have, he died as a full, a full man. And he was gathered to his people, suggests life after death. And Abraham's two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, they come together and buried him with Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. Abraham died in faith without receiving the promises of the land. He did not see them, but he welcomed them. Here's what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter of these heroes of faith. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, Genesis 12, he obeyed by going out to a place which, was, which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, 
as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has a foundation, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even as one man, and him as good as dead, at that, as many descendants as the stars of the heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, all these died in faith without receiving the promises. But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, For those who say such things make it clear that they were seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they were thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. And therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared a city for them. Are you seeking that same country? Do you desire that better country? Or is all your focus on this country? I love my country. But my focus is not on this country. Because this world is going to pass away. Are you looking forward to that city that God has prepared? So let me conclude. Abraham and Sarah may be buried in Machpelah, but they live in this heavenly city of God. My theme is the end of every person's life is death. And only God knows the number of days that he has ordained for you. That's in Psalm 139, verse 16. And scripture is clear that God's judgment follows death. Hebrews 9, 27. And inasmuch, or some versions have, just as it is appointed for men to die once and after this, judgment. Judgment. I was reading in my Bible reading calendar today in Acts chapter 10. That happened to be the reading. And I came across verses 42 and 43. Peter is preaching to Cornelius. In Caesarea. And he's telling Cornelius about Jesus. And he says Jesus is the one who has been designated by God as judge of the living and the dead. Did you catch that? He's telling this Roman centurion that God has designated Jesus to be the judge of the living and the dead. And of him, of Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Belief in his name. His name, Yeshua, means salvation. We're all going to die. And when you stand before a holy God, and we know it now is Jesus, when you stand before a holy God, Jesus, on the day of judgment, will you have the same kind of faith that Abraham had? It tells me in Galatians chapter 3, a book that, uh, a letter that the apostle Paul wrote, In verse 6, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. 
The scripture foreseeing that God would justify or declare righteous Gentiles, that's me, Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Have you placed your faith in Jesus? He is the promised seed of Abraham. He is the Messiah through the line of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, down to David, Jesus. And when you stand before a holy God in the day of judgment, will Jesus be able to see you as righteous because of faith in Jesus? Some of the saddest verses in the scriptures are that some are going to stand before Jesus one day and say, Lord, Lord, didn't I not do all these kind of things for you? And he's going to look at you and say, I don't know you. Because belief doesn't mean I believe he died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead. Even the demonic knows he was dead on the cross, buried, and rose from the dead. It's not about an intellectual belief. It's about a heart belief. And a heart belief means not only do I understand what he did for me, I'm receiving him as my Savior and Lord, and I will follow him as my Savior and Lord. That's why Billy Graham always used the word surrender. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? It's not about coming to church. I'm glad you're here, by the way. It's not about giving money to the church. I'm glad you do. It's not about getting baptized. It's not about any work you can do. It's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to his mercy he saved us. It's for by grace you're saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. There's no work you can do to get good standing with God. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ, meaning you're going to commit your life to following him as your Savior and Lord. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, but as many as received him, Jesus he came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him. The Jewish nation was not willing to pro proclaim him king. We have no king but Caesar, they cried out. Came unto his own, but his own did not receive him, but as many as received him. That's me. To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Yeshua, Savior, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God, but of God. Have you been born of God? And one is born of God through faith in Jesus, the Christ, God's son. John, towards the end of his gospel, writes in chapter 20, verse 31, but these have been written. His gospel has been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Have you surrendered to Jesus? We're in a gym right here. This was built, in, built, started building in 2003, and we were in here in 2004. But before we put this wood gym floor down, it was a cement floor. And during one of the services, I gave the congregation and the worship center to come to the gym and write names on the floor of people that you know that are dear to your heart, friends and family members who have not surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ yet. Come in here and write their names on the floor and commit to praying for them that hopefully they'll come to church in the gym here because we were in here for over 10 years before we rebuilt the sanctuary. We were in here and we were sitting on top of people's names that we wanted to see come to know Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord, there are some of those names who have come to trust Jesus Christ. But there's a lot in our church service that come here week after week after week. They hear the gospel. They think that they're trusted in Jesus Christ and they're going to stand before God one day and he says, I don't know you. 
How do you know if you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Because your life has changed. Who you once were is no longer who you are anymore. But if you have those same addictions and you have those same problems and you can't seem to lick it, probably you don't have the Holy Spirit inside you yet. It's not about knowing Jesus. We all know Jesus. Most of America knows there was a Jesus. It's about surrendering to him as your Savior and Lord. Have you surrendered to Jesus? It's appointed for men to die once and after that comes judgment. Are you ready to stand before God? Would you join me in prayer? Perhaps you've been hearing this sermon and it's actually hitting home because the Holy Spirit is driving it home in your life. And the Holy Spirit is saying, no, today is the day. You need to place your faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord and don't go another minute without doing it because there's no guarantee on how long you will live. And if you feel the Holy Spirit right now is speaking to you saying, trust Jesus now, then do it. It can start with a prayer. And the prayer can be simply, Lord Jesus, I have been faking it for many years. But I am admitting right now that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And Jesus, you are that Savior. And I believe you are the Lord. And this morning, I'm trusting in you, not just for salvation, but to come into my life and change me as Lord of my life. From this moment on, I don't serve me, I'm going to serve you. If you're talking to God in the quietness of your heart and talking to him in prayer and saying, I'm coming to the cross, I'm surrendering to you right now. Would you simply raise your hand and then put it back down so I can pray for you as a group? God sees the hand, sees the hands in the middle and the back. You can put it back down once you raise your hand. Thank you. Father God, we do come before you as humbled people. Too often we think that we can merit some kind of favor by being good. And the scripture is clear, there is none good, there is none righteous, no, not one. And the scripture is clear that when we stand before a holy God on judgment day, if, if Christ is not in us, we don't enter. I thank you for those that may have prayed that prayer during this service. Raise their hand to indicate that they're surrendering to Jesus Christ and receiving him as Savior and will follow him as Lord. And Father, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. We're still going to make mistakes. Abraham made mistakes. But Abraham never forgot who his Lord was. So Lord, do a complete change and the ones who have indicated a profession of faith in Jesus, may the Spirit of God begin the change in them, in them right now. Because that's the, Spirit's, that's the Spirit's job, is not only to convict us of our sin, but to then change us. Lord, this has been a good series in the book of Genesis on Abraham. 
Thank you for the things you've been showing us from the word. We look forward to gathering Sunday after Sunday to learn more from the word and to obey the word and to live by the word. And Father, we agree with what Tanner said at the beginning of this service. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. May each one of us have a new respect for the word of God, a new desire to read the word of God. And may we obey what we read. We pray this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. As the worship team is coming back up, I thought it appropriate that we might sing once again, For God So Loved the World. And then we'll have a final song after we sing the song, For God So Loved the World. If you made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, uh, I'd like to see you at the end of the service just to come up and I won't give you a hug, but I will say you've begun a new journey. And it's a good journey. And so come see me, and we can pray together. Thank you. Friends, let's stand and let's sing together. dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all you sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for So love the world that he gave us, his one and son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Yes. Bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. Yes, he is, friends. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his word and only son to save us, whoever believes in Who? 
Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Friends, let's keep singing together this morning.
hear your people sing holy to the king of kings holy you will always be holy holy forever father god we thank you for this time here today time being able to acknowledge and remember the fact that yes that we all will die at some point in the Lord and even though at first glance and first and first look Lord that can seem like a like a dark thought Lord it's um, for those of us that have a saving faith in you a relationship with you Lord that's not a that's not a dark thought and so Lord it's just continue to speak to us today continue to speak to those that that made life change decisions today and those and those that the holy spirit is still working on in that way father again we thank you for this time being able to gather together as a united church in one in one room together but we praise you and we thank you for that father give us a wonderful rest of our day and get us home safe and it's in Jesus' wonderful name that we pray amen Church, we love you. Have a wonderful week in the Lord. You're dismissed.